And we are recording this session um, so we can send it to folks later and people can refer back to it. Um, my name's Abby Rudolph. I uh, use she, her pronouns. I'm a member of the Food and Neighborhoods Community Coalition. I'm really glad to be here with you all today. Um, the Food and Neighborhoods Community Coalition um, is a community coalition that uh, supports community efforts to build a more just and sustainable and secure uh, local food system. Um, we are uh, a, a purely voluntary collective, many representatives of nonprofits, food businesses, um, farms, different organizations, but also just a lot of you know, eaters and consumers who care about where their food comes from and want to make sure that we have um, ethical options and an ethical system um, here in Louisville. Um, and we are here to talk about a proposal that we've come up with over the past um, six or so months. Um, it's a collaborative proposal that we've worked on with uh, upwards of 30 different groups, nonprofits, businesses, um, different organizations in Louisville and uh, surrounding areas. And um, we have a proposal that uh, we want to utilize some of the American Rescue, Rescue Plan funds that will be coming into Louisville to build a more equitable and resilient and secure local food system. We've taken a, a holistic approach to this proposal. So we wanted to think about the local food system um, as a whole, rather than, um, you know, kind of divvying up into different nonprofits. Uh, we decided to, uh, as much as possible, really come together um, as the whole food ecosystem and community in Louisville. Um, and we have thus created a, a proposal that highlights uh, existing groups and existing efforts, but also kind of maps out places where we have gaps in Louisville, where we need to uh, fill in some gaps. Um, and we have also made a concerted effort to highlight groups that are Black-led and BIPOC-led, um, and groups that have been historically underfunded, which are typically Black-led um, groups. So, you know, as we talk about um, our proposal, there may be some groups that seem to be missing. Um, and that is not because we don't think that they should be part of the local food system or that they don't have an important role to play, but that we really wanted to highlight the work of Black-led and BIPOC-led organizations that um, have been historically underfunded um, and don't typically, you know, get the um, recognition um, through different grant and funding processes. So um, what's um, going to happen today is that we're going to talk about this proposal by highlighting um, several uh, people who are have been um, intimately involved with the process of creating the proposal and represent different pieces of the proposal. Um, and then we'll also have uh, time for question and answer. Um, we will talk to uh, Ken Hillebrand with Louisville Metro, and he's going to give us um, some uh, perspective on the process for applying for American Relief um, funds. And then we also uh, will be joined by Cassie Armstrong, um, a Metro council person, um, and she can give us some perspective uh, from Metro uh, council, hopefully. Um, so if, as we're talking, you have questions, um, feel free to enter those in the Facebook or Zoom chat, um, and we'll do our best to monitor those and um, direct those to the most appropriate speaker. Um, and if you're not speaking and you're on the Zoom meeting, try to keep yourself muted so that we can hear the speaker. Um, just kind of, you know, Zoom etiquette, um, you can let us know if you are having trouble or, or have a question you can um, direct message one of us or something like that. Oh, Andrew has something to say. Oh, no, direct message Andrew if you're having any technical difficulties. <laughs> okay. Um, 
So along with uh, representing, you know, a, a wide array of different organizations that are doing really great work in the local food system, um, this proposal we estimate is going to create um, upwards of 80, you know, good paying jobs. Um, and we really want to highlight um, and we also want to really emphasize the fact that this has come together from a very democratic participatory process. Um, we started with kind of a food justice um, conversation in uh, January where um, more than 80 folks signed up to participate and give their feedback on what's going on with, you know, food access, food apartheid, land access um, in Louisville. And from there, um, we kind of recognized that art funding is a huge opportunity and something that we wanted to um, utilize to help build a more resilient food economy. We started having some um, more targeted conversations with folks and we also had two food justice learning labs um, over the past few months where we heard from folks who are um, active in the food justice world of Louisville. And so now we're kind of coming together today to talk about the proposal that has come out of all of the, that participation. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to just go ahead and ask Ken to speak a little bit from the city perspective, um, what the process looks like as of now for applying for these funds. Sure, thanks Abby and the rest of the participants today. When Andrew invited uh, me to this, I, I kind of wanted to try to manage expectations is that the, the process is constantly in flux. We're learning new things uh, every day. I have a treasury meeting at 3.30 today where we'll learn more about the reporting requirements. Um, I don't know how much background you guys want. You know, March 10th is when ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act passed. Um, at the end of June, uh, the council approved about $30 million and some immediate needs um, to address, you know, that we needed to address in the community regarding COVID health, uh, some uh, looking at some safety issues, but also looking at uh, eviction prevention, uh, utility assistance, things that were immediately impacted by COVID that we felt we could address within 100 days. Sometimes you probably heard that referred to as the first 100 day projects. And it was kind of a name that started because those were projects that we thought we could we could get off the ground within about 100 days. So that's kind of where that came from, the 100 day projects. The next round of, of funding, uh, the remaining of the $388 million, uh, the council has a resolution that's gonna be introduced tomorrow night where they're identifying the four focus areas. Um, and so that resolution is being introduced uh, tomorrow night. And then they'll look at it for a couple of weeks. And, and I think at the early, if they could vote on it would be August 26. Um, Councilwoman Armstrong might be able to address that uh, better than I can. But then, um, so once that passes, then we'll get together and start looking at what the application is going to look like. And so you guys have submitted a proposal to us. And I think, Andrew, you probably received a note back to us from us saying, hey, thanks for your submission. We, we have it, but that's not an official proposal we have the submission process worked out uh, we'll we'll let the community know Andrew's on our mailing list so we'll let him know what that process formal uh, submission process looks like uh, from there we'll make some recommendations to the council and the council will have final approval uh, on all the uh, projects that, that are being looked at the areas of uh, the four focus areas are homelessness and affordable housing uh, workforce development, healthy Louisville, healthy neighborhoods. Uh, and just I'll add my editorial comment. I think that's where the food justice uh, proposal might be the best fit. And then a public safety uh, focus area. There are a couple other things that, that are still in there is like a premium pay for such essential employees, public health contingencies. And that's something that we feel like still needs to be addressed. We don't know what public health needs are going to be coming up with, especially with the, the Delta or if there's other second rounds of, of the pandemic. And then uh, there was added eligible infrastructure, depending on the how the uh, infrastructure bill moves along. Uh, there was some language that was put in. It looks like it did not pass in the Senate, 
that said that uh, some ARPA dollars could be used for other types of infrastructure. I don't think that amendment passed, but of course, that whole bill is going to the House now, and so we'll we'll know in weeks or months what that'll look like. So that's kind of what our process looks like. It's I know it's kind of vague. We're still, you know, this plane is flying, and we're, you know, making sure the wings are still on and building them as we're as we're going along. So we appreciate everyone's patience and understanding as we as we as we move forward on this. So I think the next step is the council council will approve the priorities once we know those priorities. And I guess the other thing that's important to know is we're still waiting on the final um, document from the Treasury Department on the questions. So we, on July 16th, all the entities that are interested in participating in ARPA funding had to present questions, or that was the deadline, was July 16th. And so we're still awaiting the final results of that, the, the final question, the final uh, guidance document is what that'll be called. So that'll kind of help give us direction on what those, um, what the proposals, what the submission forms will need to look like and what they'll need to contain. So that's kind of it and kind of briefly, kind of at a high level. Um, I'm glad to answer any other questions. I do have a meeting with Treasury at 3.30 to go over reporting. So I'll be glad to stay on until then. And I have looked at the, I have seen the proposal. So um, I think you, you guys, one thing you have that's, it really looks good is the collaboration that you've put forth. And I think that's that's something that I think the council members on Monday and the mayor talked about at the press conferences, we're looking for collaborative efforts. Great, thank you so much, Ken. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna give folks just a few seconds to reflect on that and, and think if they have any follow-up questions, feel free to enter those in the chat at any point. Um, even if it's after Ken has left, we'll try to collect those and send those along and get answers um, if if we have follow-up questions. We really appreciate and, you being here and yeah. giving insight. And yeah. I will, will add, once, once we have, uh, we know what that submission process will look like, we will have uh, webinars such as like this, where we'll go through that submission process. We don't want to just put it out on the street and say, here, fill this form out. We want to kind of go through it. So let people know, here's what, here's what we need here, here's what we're looking for, just so that everyone has an equal opportunity at filling out the form and being most successful that they can be. Okay, great. Thanks. We'll look forward to um, helping to emphasize those uh, from whatever platforms we can when they're available. Um, so I'd like to uh, just give a few more details about the proposal, um, just and uh, let everyone know that we divided our proposal into four sections, and so each of the following speakers are going to kind of be speaking to um, issues that uh, can be, you know, tied to those sections. Um, we have a food policy council development, governance, and community participation. Um, we have economic development, food supply, and infrastructure. We have food access, farm to institution, and farm to people. And then we have education and training. Um, so I just wanted to briefly outline those so that you could kind of be uh, thinking in those terms as, as we're talking today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, our first um, speaker. Um, so we're gonna hear from Stevan Edwards. Um, she's the owner and principal of Chenault Solutions, LLC. Stevan has served within the public health sectors in roles ranging from volunteer to administrator um, and causes ranging from food security to youth development. Currently, she guides organizational teams along pathways that fulfill their mission and vision, improve internal infrastructure, identify their systemic impact, and implement equitable practices. She is born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, and works to improve her hometown through each project and with each connection she makes. Um, so we'll hear from Stevan. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope that you can hear me clearly. Give me some thumbs up if you can. Okay, great. Thank you, Judd. Thank you, Abby. So we all know the nutritional importance of food security, especially in regards to disparities in health outcomes. Malnutrition is not just not enough, but it's also too much of a bad 
and that malnutrition um, can result in obesity, developmental delays in youth, um, diabetes, decreased quality and years of life lived. And our goal in all of this work to ensure that people can not only live, but also thrive. And so we have found that food security during the, these COVID times is a key issue within economic stability. The root causes are related to income, transportation, and also cost. However, we also know that even though these concerns have been amplified during the pandemic response, local residents have been filling the need. They have been filling boxes, having food drives, distributing hot meals with no strings attached. And the funding that we're talking about today supports the infrastructure needed to maintain and expand this mutual aid ecosystem that is still operating and will be needed tomorrow, whether or not we are in a pandemic. So these food and ag related programming and education and training partners, as well as the services that will be provided, seek to develop the individual skills and training needed to secure a community-based food ecosystem. Increased demand for the new points of access to food sources that you will hear about today from, the, from my fellow speakers, cultivate that individual motivation, and then also grow the personal networks needed to incorporate healthy eating habits into a busy daily family life. We often talk about cooking classes and nutrition classes, but I don't want to speak from a deficit perspective but rather the fact that we are going to be tapping into the knowledge that community already has around food, how we relate to food and how we access food and amplify those strengths within community through this funding. ARP gives Louisville a chance to go beyond addressing symptoms of un an unhealthy and unjust system, but proactively create the kind of community food system that works for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Stevan. Um, again, we're going to have time for question and answers with each of our speakers. So take a moment to, to reflect on what Stevan shared and, and go ahead and share any questions you may have or hold them till the end. Um, but we'll take questions after each of our speakers have, have shared. Um, next, we're going to hear from Mike Jackson. Um, Mike Jackson is a Louisville native. That's my dog's bone, sorry. <laughs> uh, he's an far urban farmer and entrepreneur. Um, he founded Kentucky Greens LLC in 2018. Um, and Kentucky Greens provides the city of Louisville with fresh greens from nearby farms and urban market gardens. He also serves on the board of the Louisville Community Grocery. So go ahead, Mike. How are you guys doing? That's an outdated bio. I'm no longer with the grocery, uh, but I am an owner member um, and happy to be here. Um, so the need for affordable, healthy food access is pretty much based on the wide range of issues, educational, uh, financial, and mental. The options that are available to feed people aren't really aimed uh, to provide nutrition. And for years, black and brown or low income areas have been profitable places to start unhealthy businesses where owners or the cooperation, uh, corporations aren't really affected by the outcomes. Um, strengthening our food system will create many opportunities uh, to pro properly help us compete with these unhealthy groups and businesses. Um, we need to invest in our infrastructure like the Food Hub with a multitude of purposes, such as distribution, product creation, similar to chef space, but beyond culinary. Um, the uses of fresh pr produced food are limitless. Uh, we've just been taught the basics of grow and eat. Uh, focusing back on the food system, we need all hands on deck. Farming and food doesn't just stop in the field or the grocery store. Um, black farmers have been needing uh, resources to not just keep up with demand, but also prevent waste, just like the white parents. Um, the proper food hub would be able to create these outcomes that we're asking for, just like we've been working towards in the future, like jobs, higher learning, and even uh, nutrition boosting. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, now we can't. <laughs> okay. 
So I'm just going off the summary that uh, Andrew sent me. Um, and one of the things that he asked me to speak on was the corner store. And the corner store is just a, simply a basic need store um, with the understanding of the neighborhood that Ken was uh, talking about earlier. Uh, we want stores to be placed in certain areas, operated heavily to be impactful and long term, supplied by these local food businesses, not just myself, but my peers, um, to be involved with feeding our city and create more work um, down the road. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, we're, we're going to uh, hear from two more speakers, but take a moment and, and think about some of the topics that Mike spoke on and enter questions or jot down questions or just be thinking about questions um, for our Q&A time. So our next speaker is Mariel Gardner. Uh, what can I say about Mariel? She's a swimmer, she's an ice cream aficionado, a clarinetist, a vigilante. Mariel is board president of the West Louisville Women's Collaborative, or WLWC. It's a group of dynamic women committed to creating and sustaining artistic, peaceful spaces in the West End. She is also co-operator of Fifth Element Farms, aka Apocalyptic Acres, alongside Michael George. And their farm is located on a formerly vacant lot in the Parkland neighborhood. Thank you for speaking with us, Mariel. Hey, friend. Um, I get a little nervous, so I'm going to turn my camera off while I talk, um, and then I'll turn it back on for questions. Um, there are many people in this city who can talk about food insecurity in greater detail with things like data and PowerPoints, but I'm here today to talk about my experience being food insecure and living under the food apartheid in the West End. I'm a current resident of Park Duval. I grew up in Algonquin and I own and operate Fifth Element Farms, also known as Apocalyptic Acres in Parkland. My growing partner, Michael George, and I pivoted from entrepreneurial growing pursuits in March of 2020 and chose to grow produce for ourselves and share our abundance with our neighbors instead. The pandemic created an urgency in us greater than the urgency which inspired our shift away from business. Um, things like the rotten produce in our neighborhood Kroger, the rising cost of food, um, the stagnant transit system that our parents used to transport groceries to our childhood homes. We knew things would get worse because food access in the West End was already terrible and no one had done much to help yet. And true to our intuition, things got worse. This was evident. Um, we all saw through food shortages and the food lines that stretched miles that all affirmed our fears of early March. Um, that along with the minuscule variety of produce provided by grocers near us, access has also been hampered by the whims of local government. When Broadway closed at Derby, my Kroger closed. When David McAtee was murdered, my Kroger closed. Food is held hostage and can be taken from us at any time. And we also know that there's a lack of grocery options here in the West End. We know that the quality of produce changes from Prospect to Portland. And we all know that humans who last I checked need food to live. Um, and we should be able to live close to our food source. Michael and I grow on a formerly vacant lot in a 20 by 48 foot hoop house, and we've created our own ecosystem in the middle of the city using the abandoned home next door to collect rainwater. We clear tires dumped in the alley and use them to grow herbs and flowers. We have bees on site to pollinate our crops, and we hope that we're combating the pollution of rubber town by providing green space. And while this may be a small action, um, we have to be creative and work within our means to challenge the issues that impact us. We haven't done anything ingenious or revolutionary. The model of growing food and giving it, it away is popular in Detroit, Chicago, and Oakland. We're just simply actively choosing to survive along with our friends and neighbors. We built a great community of growers throughout Louisville who also use creative modalities in growing in their own growing pursuits. Uh, folks like 
Stephen Edwards and Mike Jackson, who just spoke, um, but also Letitia Marshall, who has dreams of turning an abandoned Shively golf course into a food forest. Shively is also a food desert. There are no grocery stores within its city limits. And Ebony Sutton, who grows her own produce and uses it in her catering business. There's no lack of try here. Um, there is a lack of equitable resources. Um, we would take more money. If you have money, yeah, bring it on. We'll definitely take that. Um, it never hurts. And this isn't a direct plea for funding. Um, but our work and the value of it does permit that we be granted funding. Another challenge we face um, under this apartheid is land access. Louisville Metro owns over 600 vacant lots that could easily be converted into growth spaces at low cost. Um, there is no need for a feasibility study. I am the study. I live the study. I want fresh quality food close to me. Uh, but back to land access, Fifth Element Farms needs more land so we can feed more people. If Michael and I could be afforded the opportunity to acquire city-owned vacant lots near us, we could grow enough food to stock the two pantries near us on 26th Street. With improved access to city-owned property, the Food Literacy Project could own permanent growth space. Land's intended purpose is for cultivation of food. Um, and using the abundance of land in our city land bank for agriculture and implementing plans laid forth by this wonderful community of growers and food advocates makes for a good first step to ending Louisville's food apartheid. Thank you so much, Muriel, for speaking to those very important issues. Um, I'm going to, again, ask everyone to just take a moment to reflect on what was shared and, and think about if you have follow up questions or comments um, that we can discuss during the Q&A. Our final speaker is in the form of YouTube video. Um, this um, young person is um, part of the YCAP crew with Food Literacy Project. Um, so this is Christian Broccoli sharing her thoughts on utilizing the ARC funding. My name is Christian Broussard and I'm working with the Food Literacy Project for the summer of 2021. And I believe that the American, well, part of the American Rescue Plan portion of it should go to more farms in Louisville or more green space and also a portion of it should go to more grocery stores in the West End and downtown of Louisville. So it's always nice to hear about um, the work that's being done by young people and the YCAP crew is incredible. The Food Literacy Project is incredible. Um, so it's nice to highlight that um, young voice in this conversation. Um, I think we need to be listening to our youth, especially uh, during this time of precarity and uncertainty, because they're going to um, be dealing with um, all of the effects of today in the future. Um, I see that Mike Perlin has a hand raised. I'm going to ask that you, well, actually, we can go ahead and go into um, Q&A period um i was going to give a few more details about i'm sorry i think i'll go ahead and give a few more details about the actual proposal and then we'll go into a conversation q a period if that's okay with you unless your question is needs to be asked right now mike i can wait i, I can wait until you do what you're gonna do okay <laughs> sorry for that confusing uh, <laughs> comment. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, our proposal is divided into four sections. I'm just going to talk a little bit about each one. Um, and hopefully you'll see how um, some of the issues addressed by each of the speakers uh, come into play into in, in, in the proposal. Um, so first, um, we think it's really critical that we have a more formalized 
um, participatory advisory uh, body in terms of food and ag and land in the city. So developing a food community advisory council um, to ensure community participation and accountability for these issues is, is really important. Um, we have um, put about $700,000 into that one um, effort and um, have the development over uh, a few years. Um, our second category is economic development, food supply, and infrastructure. So this is, um, you know, strengthening the local food and agriculture infrastructure um, by providing capital and resources for land purchases and improvements, um, creating small business development through value-added processing, um, creating infrastructure for storage and refrigeration, and also for composting and food recovery, um, and then also supporting the existing food and agriculture businesses that are in Louisville and um, also nonprofits that are in Louisville with a priority on BIPOC and um, BIPOC led groups and zip codes that are most impacted by food apartheid. Um, so providing funding to scale up these producer businesses and farms um, as well as food related nonprofits. Um, so here we spoke with groups like Kentucky Greens, again, um, Fifth Element Farms, also Bear Fruit and Grow, Grow LLC, Kentucky Anna Backyard Farms, um, Kentucky Agritech, um, many, many other farms, and um, think that we need to support those who are already producing food in the community. Um, then our third area is food access, farm to institution, and farm to people. So we want to increase the number and size of farmers markets, fresh stop markets, CSAs, corner stores, um, and groceries in areas impacted by food apartheid specifically, um, and to support and build capacity for existing nonprofit organizations to increase affordable access to healthy food. Um, so this is, you know, uh, supporting um, organizations like Garden Girl, Food Market, um, creating the Block to Block Corner Store Initiative that Mike spoke on, um, supporting the Louisville Association for Community Economics, or LACE, and the Louisville Community Grocery, um, supporting New Roots Fresh Stop Markets, Black Market Kentucky, uh, the Feed the West Initiative. Um, and then we also want to focus on uh, creating um, positions within Louisville Metro that address policies related to food um, and to have a you know a farm to Louisville uh, full-time position uh, to help coordinate all of these moving pieces. Um, it is not sustainable to use purely volunteer effort to coordinate all of that. Um, and then finally education and training. So um, supporting groups like the Food Literacy Project, um, Americana Community Center, Play Cousins Collective, uh, Children Shouldn't Hunger, The Harmony Project, um, Jefferson County Extension, Jefferson County Soil and Water Conservation District, um, creating a JCPS Community Garden Program, and supporting JCPS school-based gardens. Um, so that is just some, you know, going through very briefly, that's kind of the, the body of, of the proposal. Um, and so before we move on to questions, I'd just like to invite uh, Cassie Armstrong, who is Metro Council person for the 8th District in Louisville Metro, um, to just give some brief thoughts on the importance of food justice, addressing hunger, and strengthening the community food web. Well, thank you all for inviting me to be here with you today. And I'm going to keep this very short because my primary purpose is to be here and listen and to be in community with you all. Um, and I've heard so many exciting things uh, and I'm just really honored to be a part of this conversation. Um, my background is in public health. And um, so when I think about food justice and when I think about our food networks, it is something that touches each of our lives multiple times every single day. And when we have unjust systems in place, um, we all suffer for it. And, and we know that um, our marginalized communities suffer, suffer more and that 
the choices that have led to our unjust systems. Um, there have been intentional choices made by policymakers that have created systems that now uh, we, we need to make more equitable and we need to take steps to do that. And so um, I'm really excited about a lot of what I am hearing and a lot of the work that you all are doing. Um, what I really love about this is um, the collaboration. I think that um, it's so important to build those networks of working with the people who are doing the work, bringing in all the different expertise, also engaging new folks um, in building a, a really strong coalition. And um, I would urge you all, and you're already doing this, and so I guess as much as anything, just um, sort of validate that this is the right approach. But I heard someone say earlier, uh, this is not just about reacting to the effects of unjust systems. This is our chance to build more just systems. And I want to say that again because it is so rare that we have the resources to do that in government. We are always talking about how we just don't have enough money or time or resources or political will. And so often we're sort of saying, can we just do good enough? Um, and this funding in my mind represents a real opportunity where we can sort of say, no, we're not just going to do good enough. We're going to do better. We're going to do transformative change. We're going to do something that our city can truly be proud of and be a leader on um, that can actually make people's lives better. And, and hopefully, I want us to do things that show the rest of the country what it looks like to have big ideas and to invest in our communities. And so um, keep thinking big and transformatively. I think that that is exactly what this moment in our city calls for. Um, and I am happy to just be a part of the conversation. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much, Ms. Armstrong. Really appreciate that. Um, I think that uh, now we'll move on to more of the conversation side of things. Um, I realized that I only gave a specific amount for uh, what is actually the cheapest item in our proposal. Um, the proposal as a whole, um, again, it accounts for 30 plus groups, creates 80 well-paying jobs, and is really thinking holistically about the entire food ecosystem, but it's um, about $30 million. So it's a, a chunk of the ARP funds, but you know, it's not half of the ARP funds. It's, it's nothing like that. It's um, a small percentage, but a percentage of the ARP funds. And we think that's, you know, what is uh, appropriate to ask for considering how important food is uh, for all of us to live happy lives and safe and um, comfortable lives. So um, with that, uh, Mike, would you like to start us off? And then we'll go to some of the questions that have been um, put in the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say I, I was impressed by everybody who spoke, but particularly by um, Mariel's description of the kind of work that, that she and Mike are doing, and this mention of all these uh, vacant lots in the city. And the one concern I had is, um, That's okay, that, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I know that wherever anybody is in this city, um, if nothing else, they have to worry about lead, lead from, you know, the way we used to use fuel, uh, you know, for cars, as well as in some cases, uh, lead that comes from buildings that have lead paint and such. So I just wanted to be sure that you all were aware of it, which clearly you are, and that you had uh, ways to deal with that, assuming that we are able to get more 
of those vacant lots uh, for, for people in the city to do what you're doing. Uh, do you want, should we go to the, uh, the chat? There was a question, yeah, some interesting questions around the corner stores. And it would be great to get into the specifics around that. But I wanted to start it off maybe with Japa's question about food insecurity being characterized perhaps as a kind of ongoing neighborhood siege. I wonder if any of our presenters want to respond to that. I do apologize. Can you uh, define siege for me, please? Japa, feel free to unmute. Just elaborate for me. Japa, did you want to unmute and just spell that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's in the same sense that in the olden days, you'd have a castle and you would lay siege to the castle. And you would do that by controlling supplies and water sources and food sources, you know, in a way to uh, undermine the, uh, you know, the possibility of a, of a neighborhood or a group of people improving their circumstances out of their own independent action. Um, Michael and I definitely, not Michael Jackson, Michael George and I, uh, definitely feel that food is weaponized against the West End. Um, and we had to form some type of weapon to fight against that war tactic. Um, so this is just, this is the weapon that we are choosing to build community um, through food and to show love for our neighbors. If there aren't other responses to that, yeah, why don't we uh, go to the question about how to get more corner stores supplying healthy food in a walkable distance. There was a question about funding, uh, mentioned about how it's being used, I think, from Molina uh, in San Francisco. So maybe go to you, Mike, first. So just to touch on also what Joppa was just saying, with the corner stores, we want to put those corner stores actually where these housing developments are. Um, we don't want corner stores that we're not trying to create something with glitz and grammar. Uh, glamour. We're trying to actually give people their basic needs. Um, one thing that, you know, is from the nutrition study um, is what the solutions of individual food security insecurity are. Um, people have lack of money. So that means poor nutrition, lack of energy. Um, and then that, that leads to using your money, uh, you know, not using your money wisely. So these corner stores are going to be operating and working with people like Mario, Steve, and myself, um, and also Whitney, because we want to put these products that we're creating into these stores. Um, so being trusted brands. So that's kind of why we're a for-profit business. Um, and I hope I'm not rambling, uh, but pretty much when you think of Kentucky Greens, we want people to be able to say, okay, these, this is a product that we trust and we recognize. Um, so that's, that's what we're leading towards with these corner stores. And the, in order to get the funding, it takes partnerships, it takes buy-in, it takes group effort, and also an understanding of the why. Anyone else want to jump in on that? And maybe Melina, if you have thoughts or ex from your experience, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to ask because um, I hear you know you saying, Mike, that we're talking about creating new corner stores in San Francisco. Obviously, like there is no room and no land, and there were existing corner stores that had been like systemically and purposefully granted liquor and tobacco licenses in poor neighborhoods and no grocery stores. So it was a very urban food desert and what the community members did was form a similar coalition where they lobbied the actual store owners to start stocking um, fresh and healthy food which would be left over from like the city 
farmer's market and they could go like it was part of that food system that was already existing. Um, but then they also went to City Hall and said, stop granting liquor and tobacco licenses down here. Like we've got enough. That's fine. Um, so I wanted to kind of see if you were also thinking about kind of using existing corner, corner stores and talking to existing owners, if that was possible. Yeah, definitely possible. Um, I don't know if you've heard of a healthy in a hurry mm -hmm. that the YMCA had a couple of years here in Louisville. Um, so that was one of the things that they tried. Um, so what we're trying to do is similar, but just have more buy-in and also new owners. So I'm not trying to own one of these corner stores. Yeah. Kentucky Greens doesn't want to own one of these corner stores. We just want to be one of the sources uh, for your inventory. Um, and then, you know, that tobacco licensing is actually pretty interesting because we also asked about how does that work uh, with alcohol? And that's one of the questions I haven't been able to receive yet. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe missing questions. Uh, folks can feel free to, to go off, off mute and ask a question directly if you'd like. Um, Shamika is sharing some comments I can share while folks are thinking of questions. Um, well, the last one she shared was. Oh no. Yeah. Can you all hear me? Yeah, now it's coming in. Keep, no. keep going. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. I just wanted to make sure I jump in and tell you all awesome work. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it uh, being invited to this conversation. It's so good to know. Um, during, in the last year and a half, we had to just come together and feed so many people. That need is great. It's going to continue to grow. And so I think that a way to be proactive is to ensure that we are looking at all the systems that work and definitely highlighting and lifting up BIPOC um, operated and, and funded and making sure that they're fully funded and also those that employ BIPOC people and people from the neighborhood. And a lot of people, I'm in, I live in Shively, but a lot of people in PRP, um, in the East End and uh, all over the Jamestown area, there's some food insecurity there as well. And so it looks different in those communities. And so just making sure that we're talking to the people who service the different communities, the different types of food pantries and making sure that they also get some of this funding and so they can be set up. I know that I saw a few, I looked, I saw Pastor Finley on here and Pastor Finley has a um, pantry that his church has grown over the years. I think that this is a great um, initiative for FRP, um, um, for faith groups to be engaged and get some of the funding to be able to um, use this for the, the work of the churches. I think this is a faith initiative as well. And I hope that they are again, even if it's like pantry or even if it's um, serving meals, it's just the need is just so great. It's, it's and I saw it so much firsthand. And I just, anyway, I just wanted to commend you all and um, and just say thank you for doing this and, and keep pushing. There, This should definitely be funded and let me know what I can do, what anyone with resources can do to help this initiative. Thank you so much, Shamika. Um, yeah, it's great to have you with us today. As I think everyone knows Shamika is running uh, to be our next mayor. Um, and speaking of Pastor Finley, uh, Timothy, Timothy has a question about, uh, because the ARP money is a one-time thing, what are some tools and frameworks to adequately address race and class food-related inequities? Any of our presenters wanna take the same, the same research that um, what Food and Neighborhood has already come up with, also the Louisville Grocery Co-op. Um, Pastor Tim, uh, pretty much if, when we did a walk uh, in West Louisville, one of the things that I pointed out were the number of restaurants, the uh, number of, we even walked into some of these gas stations and correct me if, if I'm wrong or if, if it doesn't make sense, we see the issues in, in West Louisville. Um, so creating the food, and I hope I'm not rambling because I feel like I am. There's just so many, so many ways I can word that. And Mario, please help me with that if you don't mind. 
I can hop in on this one, I would like to address the sustainability pieces. So when we look at the fact that we that these ARP funds are startup funds, right? They are launching funds in order to expand infrastructure, but it's actually starting up projects and creating those access points for food. We have to make sure that those access points, whether it be a store or a farm, an urban farm, or even a farm stand, is ready and prepared um, and equipped and has the infrastructure to meet the demand for food. But then on the other end, we need to tap into those sources of income that people do have in order to access food, whether it is government assistance, um, working especially through the education and training pieces on teaching people how to grow their own food, but, but also um, economic development, individual and family economic development, so that they've been able to keep the cycle going of the distribution and the preservation of food. I uh, just wanted to also put a plug in for or Pastor Tim, who's also running for mayor. And thank you for being here. I, I wonder if you had any thoughts um, on that point as well. Yeah, well, thank you all for having me. I echo what Shamika said. I think this is uh, exciting times and um, a lot of great information. Um, I was just having a conversation surrounding Black farmers and sort of a restorative justice piece uh, because I think that there needs to be some thought around um, direct support from community to black farmers um, who have been marginalized and left out of many many conversations to this point um, and I think that if we're going to have an equitable solution um, and deal with righting some wrongs um, I think it would be extremely important um, that we lift up many black farmers, black entrepreneurs that have been doing this work for years um, and figure out ways to um, sort of get support to them and not just support in terms of manpower addressing their plans, but getting financial support um, <laughs> where they have been left out of many, many conversations. So again, thank you all for having me. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more, more about this. Thanks. Thank you, Pastor Tim. And yeah, I think about 3 million of the proposal is specifically for BIPOC farmers. And I think it addresses that issue of kind of putting in place the structures, the capacities that will, you know, bring them into the future as well to build up, you know, the equipment they need, the infrastructure and all of that. So I think it fits well with that economic recovery piece that our funds are supposed to be addressing. Other questions? Melina has one here. Are we explicitly baking in sustainable, eco-conscious, agricultural, environmental practices into this work? Um, some call it agroecology. Most, mostly asking in case more funding should be requested to commit to climate conscious practices. Great question. Anyone like to? To grab that one, respond to that. I think part of the answer is in the question itself is that, you know, agroecological agro practices are what cool the planet. It's what brings carbon from the atmosphere into the soil and keeps it there. So, well, with, with good practices, it keeps it there. But I think that's the difference between conventional kind of fossil fuel related agriculture, which is so highly dependent on on petroleum and, you know, I think something like 30% of the emissions are from agriculture. So the kind of agriculture that this is supporting are sustainable agroecological practices, organic and so on. So it's a great question. And I think we try to make that connection to climate effects, um, but perhaps we should do more on that. Others want to address that or have other questions? I'd love to, um, I'd love to, you know, make sure that we 
end on time and don't, you know, don't hesitate to continue sharing your questions. We're definitely going to save the chat. Um, someone besides me, please do that. One of the hosts, please save the chat so that we have all of these great suggestions and questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let you all know some ways that we can continue the conversation and community together. Um, the Food and Neighborhoods Community Coalition has two active working groups, uh, the Policy Action um, Working Group, which meets every third Thursday of the month from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m., and the Urban Agriculture Coalition, which meets every fourth Thursday of the month, <clears throat> excuse me, from 12 to 1.30 p.m. I'm going to share uh, the Food and Neighborhoods calendar as a link in the chat, um, and that's where you can see those meeting times. Um, and, and please feel free to join us to continue this conversation. Um, I hope that we can also, you know, continue conversation via email if there are those in uh, this forum setting that would like to become more active in helping us with later drafts of our proposal or brainstorming, you know, additions to the proposal. We're very open to that. Um, I think, you know, a hundred brains are way better than three. Um, three brains are better than one, but let's get as close to a thousand brains on this as we can. Um, so we very much uh, welcome thoughts, criticisms, questions, um, you know, and want to be a very open uh, communicative group in that way. I mean, we really are a grassroots coalition. You know, we're not a nonprofit. We don't have a staff. We just are people who care. And so you all are all part of it if you want to be. Um, I also just want to invite folks to consider becoming a member owner of the Louisville Community Grocery. Um, if someone wants to put that um, maybe website in the chat, um, and it is four o'clock, but if there are like final thoughts or uh, other announcements for, you know, other ways to continue this conversation or take action on food justice, I'd love for folks to share in the chat or um, turn your mic on and share with us. Well, thank you all so much for, for joining and giving an hour of your afternoon to this topic. Um, you know, we're really excited about this opportunity and really hope that it can um, come to fruition and that some of these wonderful projects and this wonderful work that has been going on and is going on can get funded in a way that makes sense um, and be, you know, finally really supported, made stronger. Um, and I am just glad that, yeah, I'm glad to have seen all your faces and heard from you all. Um, it's definitely encouraging to be in community and um, happy to know that we're in it together. And thank you, Judd and um, Paz to Peace for hosting us. Yes, thank you all very much for joining. And I want to remind you, uh, the Beloved Community, which is one of the groups that's helping organize this, is going to be focusing on uh, immigrants and refugees and welcome and integration process next month. So uh, stay tuned to more learning labs and reckoning forums on important issues happening in Louisville uh, to create the beloved community. So thanks so much for everyone joining and uh, stay tuned. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. And you're welcome to unmute yourself to sign out, kind of that collective. Bye-bye, everybody. It's always nice to hear the cacophony of voices. So. Bye. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Take care, Tyler.